Hey. So how many people here know what a tiny house is? Yeah? All right, how many of you feel like you could live in one? Maybe not. Let me re-ask the question. How many people work in jobs that you don't feel completely inspired by? Or maybe you've had a dream that always felt just a bit out of reach. Or maybe you just don't feel like you have enough time for yourself or your family. Because for those of us that live in tiny houses, the definition may be a home that's under 400 square feet, but how we see it is a tool to live a life that we choose. It's a tool that we use to avoid the financial traps that leave so many people treading water. And once you put your need for space up against your need to achieve your dreams, the actual relevance of a tiny house, it becomes much more apparent. See, my dream was never to be on television. My dream was to be a professional skier. And when I was in my early 20s, I had this moment where I felt that dream escaping me, and I knew that I needed to make a big shift in my life if I was gonna actually make it happen. And so what I did was I actually bought a motorhome, and I fixed it up with everything I had, and I took a job, a minimum wage job, four states away in a place that I didn't know anyone, and went out on this kind of big journey to pursue the dream, and the crazy thing was, it happened. And I actually spent my late 20s and my early 30s traveling the world, getting paid to ski, you know, rubbing elbows with my heroes. And that sense of satisfaction, that gratification that came with it was so profound, I know that it's gonna last with me for the rest of my life. And I can tell you 100% that it would have never happened if I didn't have the ability to pare down on the financial demands of my life so that I could really focus on making this dream a reality. So, in 2011, I built my first tiny home. And shortly after, I read a book by a hero of mine and a visionary person named Jay Schaefer. And in the book, he talked about how the auto industry had actually gone through this process where they were confronted with the need to affect their efficiency of the vehicles. And they did so in a short time. And the craziest thing, is that they didn't actually jeopardize the power of the engines. And it's this really remarkable thing because now we have vehicles that actually travel so much further, two to three times on the same gallon of gasoline, and at the same time, we're going from zero to 60 in record time. And this is this very big concept to me because what it really proves is that efficiency and power are not mutually exclusive. And I find it really useful when I'm actually applying the same concept into my work as a tiny house designer. So, efficiency, when you're actually thinking about construction, is all about energy use. So that's heating and cooling, but it's also cost. It's about good use of materials, it's about minimizing waste. And the whole point, or the concept involved with a tiny house is that by building very small, but then actually making these spaces very high functioning, we can achieve extremely efficient homes, right? So efficiency is really, it's this kind of thing that I work and my specialty is actually these kind of transforming solutions to make the maximizing the use of a space. However, if I'm not careful, these clever contraptions, they can easily become cumbersome. And when that happens, the entire value of that design is lost. So my goal is really is to design multi-purpose solutions that work as a fluid system. And that's when I believe that true efficiency is achieved. Now, the power of a space really comes down to someone's appreciation of it. And whether it's a big home or a small home, that really comes down to the customization and making someone feel like that space is theirs. And that can happen with something as little as just a, a live edge countertop that they just love, or a clawfoot bathtub, or maybe a stained glass window. For me, it is my spiral staircase. It's this really cute, adorable wood stove that I have that heats my house. It's those things that make me feel so comfortable when I'm there. For a lot of people, what really works is attaching sentimental items. So for example, if I was to repurpose somebody's defunct old grand piano, that's not gonna work. 
and then actually repurpose it into something that's needed like a bed frame, that's a very good example of a very powerful design. However, the power of a home can also be to facilitate growth in someone's life. And that is where I become extremely inspired. So a really good example of that would be, say, a flight simulator that looks antiquated and it's big and it doesn't belong in a tiny home, but if this is the item that can actually transform someone's life by letting the owner achieve that long-held dream of becoming a pilot, and then that pilot's license actually turns into a job and the job into a career, that is an example of an extremely powerful design that can really change someone's life. So the same way that a home has this power to propel someone's life forward, the lack of a home really can be a debilitating burden. In this country, we've gone through a series of decades where the cost of our housing has outpaced our incomes to such a degree that we have this growing homeless population. And we have families spending more and more of their income every year on their housing. You see, the tiny house movement is not a fad based upon an infatuation with everything small. The tiny house movement is a response to these growing environmental and economic factors that are only gonna become more and more extreme in years to come. And many people are looking at tiny homes as this ability, as this way to address these new realities. And the funny thing is, tiny houses are nothing new. You see, in 1950, the average median home size for a family of four was under 1,000 square feet. And it's hard to believe now because the average median home size now is 2,500 square feet. In 1999, when I started building homes, the average median income was around $40,000, but the average home sale price, or the median home sale price, was $160,000. Now, fast forward to 2016, the median home sale price in our country is over $300,000, and that's an increase of 93% in 17 years. So, what that really means is that the cost of our housing has been outpacing the gains in our income by three times over this period. And if you actually factor in inflation, the median average wage in this country has actually gone down by 2.5% during that time. And this is the first time in modern history in America where our wages have stayed stagnant for a decade. And now it's been over two. So how did this happen? Well, I'll tell you a story. When I first started building tiny homes, or not tiny homes, big homes, in the early 2000s, we were doing major remodels. And almost entirely, we were doing them for couples who had already raised their family in a much more modest home. And what they were doing is they were using the, the equity that had appreciated over the years to reinvest in their home, doubling the square footage, and actually right at the moment where their need for the space was the least. And they weren't doing it because of their need for the space. They were doing it entirely based upon this idea that their house was going to be a retirement plan. It was an investment. And the problem is when enough people start looking at real estate strictly as an investment, is it turns into a self-perpetuating cycle. So the appreciation of our housing is completely dependent on the demand, but that demand is completely dependent on the expectation of appreciation. So what it's done is it's taking a larger and larger portion of our country's net worth and actually channeled it into real estate, which is a highly fluctuating asset and has left us exposed as a country to housing downturns. And we felt the broad ripple effects in 2008 when we had a bubble that burst. And what we did was to mitigate the recession as well as also try to boost the economy back up and incur a recovery, we lowered our interest rates. You see, that's the tool that we use to actually start to incentivize purchasing and borrowing of housing. And what's happened is we actually, it was very successful. It was a terrific thing. And the appreciation of our houses have gained right back to the same point 
where we, we were right before the bubble burst in 2007. The only problem with that is that our wages haven't increased. And now we've actually lost the ability of our, our most effective financial tool to mitigate any future adjustment because our interest rates are still as low as they can go. We can't lower them anymore. And we already know that we have eight to 10,000 people per day entering retirement age. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is what's gonna happen when the baby boomers go to cash in on their retirement plan? Who's gonna absorb these homes? You see, there's a number of worrisome factors when thinking about who is going to absorb the homes from retirees because today in the economy, although the employment numbers are good, the wages are down. Plus, younger generations are actually coming out of college with unprecedented levels of student loan debt. That is not percent, actually. That is number in billions there on the left. And right now we're at 1.3 trillion. So that's a really big issue because on top of that, attitudes are shifting. You know, family sizes are smaller. People are moving around a lot more. And there's this big trend to moving away from the suburbs and into our city centers. And the bottom line is when the baby boomers go to cash in on retirement plans, there's a very good chance that they're gonna be faced with the reality that younger generations are in no position to afford these large homes and are no longer interested in a large home in the suburbs. Now, I know this sounds like a very grave scenario, but I'm not here to give you a presentation about doom and gloom. I'm here to talk about opportunity because here I see a perfect opportunity to apply the same principles that we learned about power and efficiency to the needs of our housing sector. You see, a tiny home could be a very powerful tool for us to help us ad address these issues. However, right now we have rules that basically make living in a tiny home virtually impossible. The reality is, is the hardest part about living in a tiny home is not how you pare down your shoe collection, contrary to popular belief. The hardest part is navigating building codes and zoning requirements that really limit their creation. So. There is an issue going on, and people definitely recognize that this is an issue. So in 2016, I was part of a delegation that actually successfully articulated the need to readjust and amend our building codes to accommodate for tiny houses. And in 2018, those amendments will be implemented, and now it's up to the local municipalities to adopt those recommendations. However, the harder part facing tiny homes is convincing zoning officials to actually permit tiny homes into the community. You see, the responsibility of zoning officials is actually to look out for the interests of the people within their community and making sure that no policy that they introduce is going to negatively affect the property values is number one. Now, any time that we start to implement any kind of affordable housing projects, inevitably, we end up lowering the property values in the surrounding area. And that's why everybody likes the idea of affordable housing, but it's just as long as it's not in my backyard, right? Tiny homes have this unique ability to actually create lower cost housing in our communities without negatively affecting the property values because we can, they can be dispersed. They're small enough that they can fit into the cracks of our already existing infrastructure. And that is a really big thing because it actually does two things for us. You know, every time that we actually consolidate low income housing or any kind of affordable housing, what we inevitably create is we create a project or we create a trailer park or we create a slum and we end up perpetuating an environment that continues the cycle of poverty by cutting off low-income individuals from access to opportunity. So fortunately, there are a few, quite a few cities that are recognizing that affordable housing needs to be implemented better, and many of them are doing it by trying to encourage something called backyard cottages, or basically mother-in-law apartments, essentially tiny homes on foundations in backyards. 
and they're doing it to try to tackle some of the big issues with the need for urban density, you know, the need for efficiency within our city as well as low cost housing and ironically traffic congestion. However, these policies haven't had the desired effect that advocates like myself had hoped because of one important reason. And that's because people that can afford to build a backyard cottage or a tiny home in their yard lack the financial incentive to share that property with another family. And the flip side is that people that actually could use the relief from having a rentable space in their backyard are in no position to take on an extra construction loan to actually make that a reality. So there is one important precedence that's happened in our country which is making a major distinction. Fresno, California has rewritten their zoning ordinances to allow tiny homes on wheels to be used as accessory dwelling units on existing properties of 6,000 feet or greater. And this is a really important distinction because what it essentially allows is for a, a, a family or a property owner who's struggling to pay their mortgage a pathway to actually having relief by using a tiny home in a partnership. What it also does is create a pathway for a lower income family to move into an area of greater affluence where their children can grow up with more opportunity. And the thing that actually makes it all work is that these can be implemented in ways that don't negatively affect the surrounding property values and it requires no additional infrastructure cost from the municipalities. See, I think that we all want to live or we all want cities that have space for our school teachers, our police officers, the firemen, the carpenters, the artists, and the musicians because that actually elevates the quality of life for everyone in the community. And if a tiny house can be a tool that we can use to address the needs of expanded affordable housing as well as providing a pathway for struggling homeowners to avoid foreclosure and actually address their issues in a different way than selling their property. This is a very powerful tool. It's a win-win scenario and in my world that is the hallmark of good design. You see tiny home movement and the tiny house movement continues to grow despite major hurdles in legality because tiny houses are not a fad. Tiny houses are a response to this growing set of economic and environmental factors in our country. And the reality is we all have incentive right now to start looking for all the tools available to us to address the needs of a changing world. Thank you very much.